Acts chapter 4, verse 31. We're talking today, we've been in this idea out of the book of Acts about the early church, when the church first started. And last Sunday, we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. I just want to kind of stay in that, that, that stream, stay in that vein, and talk to you about one of the results or one of the signs that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. And when I say that, if you don't know who the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is the beautiful third person of the Trinity. So we believe at Zoe in, in the Father, we believe in the Son, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. One of the evidence that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is working in your life is boldness. And I like this. I like this idea because I'm loud. So I just like that idea that we can be bold and be Christians. But one of the evidence of the Holy Spirit is that he gives you a spirit that is bold. In fact, one of my favorite verses of the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1 says, God has not given you a spirit of timidity. Or other translations would say a spirit of fear. So God, if he didn't give us a spirit of fear, what did he give us? He gave us a spirit of power and love and sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, just because I don't have a spirit of fear does not mean I can watch scary films. Because I'm a wussy. And as scary as it gets for me is scream. Somebody say amen. Even though I don't have a spirit of fear, I'm not dumb, okay? But God did not give you a spirit of fear. He gave you a spirit of power. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Acts 1, 8, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will receive power. Now that Greek word, power, is the word dunamai. It's where we get the word dynamite. So the Spirit of God gives you dynamite. Not literal physical dynamite, but it gives you dynamite on the inside. Power to overcome addiction. To overcome trauma. To deal with abuse. It gives you power to forgive. But one of the things that the power of the Holy Spirit does is gives you the power to be a witness for Jesus. Well, another way you could say that is to share the good news, that God is good, God loves people. The message of the gospel, the message of grace, the power of the Holy Spirit is working in us, not so that we could get free and enjoy our lives, but the, so we could share this goodness with other people. That the people around us that are suffering, are hopeless, are in pain, the people around us that are in addiction don't have to stay there. In other words, what God's saying is, I'll do something so good in you that it cannot stay there. It'll start to work through you. That's how you know the Holy Spirit is active in your life. The Holy Spirit is not limiting his activity to goosebumps. You ever be around somebody, these Christians these days, you talk to them about God, and they're like, oh my gosh, chicken skin, look, chicken skin. Just got it, just got it again, chicken skin. God is not limited to chicken skin. He goes beyond what he does in you so that it could potentially affect others. So he says, I want you to wait here until you receive the power and then... In other words, you're not going to do this without. And then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. I just want to encourage you today. I think that we need more Christians that are bold. And I'm not saying that's, that's volume. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't work in extroverts and limit himself with introverts. It has nothing to do with personalities. The Holy Spirit works in your personality so good that through the uniqueness of the way God created you, His message is lived through. His goodness is carried out. His love is evident in people's lives. It's not about volume or personality. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit working in you and through you. I want to preach a message today. Write down the title. It's pretty easy. 
pretty bold if you ask me. It's pretty bold, man. You ever have somebody say something you're like, whoa. It's pretty bold. Like last week, this lost demonic kid wore a clipper jersey into our church. And I was like, whoa. Pretty bold if you ask me. After the 10 a.m., this guy literally walked up. He's like, Pastor, I'm so sorry. Sneak it out. I'm going to the Clipper game. I'm like, that's like, that's like going from the church to the club. Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Pretty bold, if you ask me. Acts 4, 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, we're not afraid of being Christians. See, I think the problem with Christians today is we're like spiritually enough to be saved, but we're in the flesh enough to be miserable. The Holy Spirit works in you, not so that you're barely hanging on in your faith, but so that he does something so good that you want to share your faith. You want to talk about God. You want to share what he's doing in you. It actually starts flowing through you. That's the evidence of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is not chicken skin. It's are you sharing your faith? Are you talking about God? Can you not help but testify of the goodness and the grace of God? The Holy Spirit is working in you so mightily that Jeremiah the prophet, he said it this way. He said, when God started working in me, it was like a fire shut up in my bones. He goes on to say, there was no way I could keep this to myself. I've got to tell everybody, I know that I am a nobody, but let me tell you about a somebody. I know that I'm ordinary, but let me tell you about the one who's extraordinary. I know I'm a sinner, but let me tell you about the man of grace. It is not by me that I should boast. There's only one hero in this story, and the Holy Spirit has been moving in me so much. I'm going to talk about it. You know what L.A. needs? L.A. needs authentic Christians. You know what L.A. needs? Genuine believers. You know what, you know what your world needs, your eco, your world, your influence? They need somebody that's real, somebody that's humble, somebody that's broken, somebody that says the Holy Spirit is, I'm still in progress, but I tell you, I'm bold about what he's changing. I'm bold about what he's removing. I'm bold about what he's washing away. I'm bold about what I've been delivered from. You, you see me now, but you don't know what I went through three years ago. You have no idea where I was when I was 12. You, you couldn't even imagine. You see me today, but I once was lost, and I once was dead, and I once was blind, but yet by the grace of God, I stand here. It's the Holy Spirit does. It's pretty bold if you ask me. I think you'll, you'll stay unsatisfied if you're just spiritually enough. I'm saved. You're so in the flesh. You ever notice that you're still miserable? The Holy Spirit wants to do something, not so that he can get to them. <laughs> His first agenda is to first get to you. And he heals, and he shapes, and he talks, and he encourages. We talked about it last Sunday, the role of the Holy Spirit. He is the great comforter. He is the great teacher. He is the great reminder. He is the great provider. This is what the Holy Spirit does. And as he does these great things in us, all of a sudden we can't but help talk about Jesus. Share of his great love. Hey, I know, uh, I know you don't go to church. Oh, it's crazy. I, I do. Um, I, go, I, I go to Zoe. And... Um, uh, I know I'm probably getting annoying because, you know, you see me on, you know, uh, my Instagram story. And, you know, I'm like posting scriptures now, but it's crazy. Um, I just can't but help talk about God. Religion says you have to. Grace says I want to. Religion says, like, I've got to post about church. When the Holy Spirit's doing something in your life, you're like, I got to share. It's like, I just... It's a river of God flowing out of me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He works in us. It's his first agenda. And the result, the fruit of it, 
is to testify of his goodness. Do you realize that God has the ability to save and deliver and heal people in your wake just by you talking about what he's done in you? You understand? So the Holy Spirit says, wait here. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you're going to go out and you will be my witnesses. Witnesses is bigger than a LeBron James campaign. Although, please pray for the Lakers. In fact, church, let's fast and pray. In Jesus' name. But we're all witnesses. And we're testifying of the goodness and the grace of God. I want to give you three things to encourage you today. That when the Holy Spirit's active in your life, he'll do these three things. Write down the first one. The first thing he'll do is he'll bring conviction. He'll bring great conviction. You'll be convicted about, you know, about the standard of living. The standard that's been set by you, by God, really. You're living at maybe your standard, but God will always call you to his standard. Maybe right now your conviction's like down here. That's fine. The Holy Spirit will just start to raise the bar about your convictions. And then he'll say, because I, I think, again, one of the signs that God's kind of working your life is that the bar doesn't get lower. It's actually opposite. The bar like gets higher. It's like God's just been dealing with me about my, my morals. And he's been dealing with me about my money. That you know that you're talking and living with God when God starts being like, hey, I've got to, I want to convict you about tithing. You know it, but I'm going to convict you that you've got a conviction about the first 10% goes to God. I want to convict you about your entertainment. I want to convict you about what you're watching and listening to. Like I, I, I just, by the way, I've got real sensitivity to, to music with cuss words. Like I just, this is just my conviction. And I've got such a conviction about like when it comes on, I'm like, ah, 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 ah. Like you're, ah, they're cussing, ah. And why? Because that's what God brought me out of. Like when God saved my life, I took CDs. Y'all don't even know, Google that. I walked to a clip at a summer camp. Like every great rapper that ever once was alive just went flying off the cliff. And it's just like I've got a conviction that about what, what I put in my ears. i got a conviction even about what my kids listen to. L- last week in between services, I, I, I took uh, two of my boys. We went to, the, to SoFi to go watch the, well, God's favorite football team, the Seattle Seahawks. And so, um, and so we're there at SoFi, and we, we get there in like in the second quarter, in the second quarter. And um, we're sitting there, and these two guys in front of us, right, the row in front of us, get into a fight. One of them is a Charger fan, and these two guys sitting there, they're in Raider jerseys. Shocker, right? Shocker. Wait, hold on. The Raiders aren't playing, but you're in Raider jerseys. You came to pick a fight, okay, bro? You knew what you were doing. He woke up and chose violence. He knew the assignment. No, this is not good, bro. So they had gotten into a confrontation earlier, I guess, in the game, from what I could hear, and the, the, the Charger guy who's now had a few too many, God bless the NFL fan. And so he comes over and he's talking to the Raider guys and the Charger guy, he's just letting it fly, man. He's just, you know, he's just blah, blah, just bad word. Bad. And I got my two of my guys with me. And I, I just, I got a conviction about language. I really do. And so I'm just sitting there. I'm like, my boys are not going to learn this from a Raider or a Charger fan. Seahawks fan, maybe. I get it. I get it. I get it. Seahawks fan, they'd be like, boys, so what this is. I got a conviction about it. So I'm just like, hey. Like I go full grown man dad bod. (laughs) Hey. (laughs) He didn't hear me first time. (laughs) Had to do it again. (laughs) Hey. (laughs) Point at my guys. What are you doing? Language. The guy's like, <laughs> the guy's like this. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> later, later, even the Raider guy, when he walked away, the good Raider guy turned around. He's like, yo, hey, my bad, Holmes, my bad. <laughs> Stubby in. I got a conviction about this stuff. I just wonder for you, like, what are your convictions I think one of the problems we're facing today is like in our culture, we're so obsessed with vision. But I promise you, if you'll focus on values, 
your vision will come to pass. In fact, maybe your bigger problem is that you love your vision more than your values. And you want to you fulfill what's in your heart? Show me your values. I'll show you your future. We can interchange these words, conviction or values, but it's like I have a conviction about my family being in the house of God. Joshua chapter 24, verse 16, you choose whatever gods you want to choose. But Joshua is basically saying, y'all can do whatever you want to do in your house. I don't control your home. That's your decision. That's your family. That's your money. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a conviction. You got to make up your mind. And I always believe when you're walking with God, he never allows you to take off for indulgences. He actually adds on the conviction. I'm calling you to another level. It's not legalism. It's the Holy Spirit. You ever notice that you think that indulgence will bring you satisfaction, but it's actually discipline and denial that bring it? Listen, don't listen to the lie of the enemy that the more you indulge, the better you'll feel. I wake up every Monday morning miserable. Why? McFlurries. <laughs> miserable. It's never the indulgence. It's the denial. And the Holy Spirit's working in us so we have conviction. Stop batting off the voice of God in your life. You know, like, when you, when you say something, when you do something, and God's like, ah, no, 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 we're not doing that, we're not doing that, we're not talking like that, we're not acting like that, we're not going there. Like, I hope that that guy got in his car, and the Holy Spirit started going, you're not going to Clipper Gang. You're not going straight from the house of God to that. It's the spirit of Halloween. I know, so dumb. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit will convict you. And one of, the Holy, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does, he does not just convict you about the standards in your life, but I think he also convicts you about sharing your faith. You know, Jesus said, who would ever light a lamp and put it under a bed? He says things like, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. So he said, let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify the Father. We don't shine bright in our cities so that we can get recognition. We got to shine bright in our cities so that God can get glorified, so that God can receive the honor. And people see the way you live and your joy and your strength and your marriage and your relationships and your peace. And they go, there must be a God in heaven. Where did our salt go? Where did our light go? God wants you to be a witness in the earth. He's not, he, he didn't call you just to consume. He called you to create. He called you to be a witness. You, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. And you got a conviction about it. You got it. It's like, it's like something that's like, oh, man, this, I got to share this. Look at Romans 1.16. Put it on the screen. I love this verse from Paul. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Not, I'm really not ashamed of like what people think about me. Can I just remind you that there's going to be people in the world or, or whatever you want to say, society or culture, whatever word you want to use there, that are actually vehemently opposed to the way you're living. And they're actually going to think that your belief structure is like totally out to lunch. And Jesus warned us of this. He said, listen, guys, they hate me. They are going to hate you. If you're going to be a Christian, listen, this early church that we're talking about today, they were not afraid of like persecution. They were facing execution, and yet they still said, I cannot be quiet about my faith. It doesn't matter if they, you try and cancel me, you try and, like, you try and ostracize me, you try and kick me out of the group, you try and, like, you know, you know like, you, you ever been on a group message and someone just, like, takes you off of the group message? Like, ah, oh, dang. It doesn't matter what happens, I'm not bowing down. Like, this is like Daniel and Babylon type stuff. Like, I'm not going to succumb. I'm not going to act. I'm going to stand up for my beliefs. I've got a conviction, not just about what God's doing in me, but what he could do in you. And you may hate God right now, but God loves you. Oh, I just love this in Acts 4. Watch this in, in the same chapter, verse 19, a few verses before. This is Peter and John. Peter and John said to them, hey, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, well, sir, you can be the judge of that. But for us, me and John here, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. 
sir, I, I, I don't mean any disrespect. I know you've got a big office and a huge title and a power suit on, but sir, we cannot but speak about the things that we have seen and heard. I have seen too much and I have heard too much. I know too much about the cross. I know too much about the blood. I know too much about Jesus. I've got to share about my faith. I'll never forget when I, when I was growing up, um, I'm a pastor's kid, so when I was growing up, we, we lived in, on this island called Whidbey Island in, in the state of Washington. And we lived in this small town called Oak Harbor. And in our town, our only really claim to fame was we were the second largest naval air, air station in America. And so all my friends growing up were, were military families, all, Navy kids. And so one of the things I loved about having a Navy base in our town was the Navy had the best gym. So we would, we would always go play basketball at the Navy base gym. But, you know, you can only get on base if you're military. So I'd have to go with my military buddies. So we used to park our cars or we'd get dropped off at the top of this hill. We'd get onto a shuttle and the shuttle would take us onto the base and take us to the gym. Well, again, all my buddies are, you know, they're, they're military. So I'll never get this one time, like I'm maybe like in middle school or something. And, um, and we're getting on the van and all my buddies have their military ID. And so we're getting on and, and the driver's asking them, you know, like, do you have ID? Do you have your ID? And I knew my, I'm last. I knew my, my time's coming. I'm the only one that's not military. And so the guy, you know, I'm getting on. The guy's like, he's like, you know, I, okay, you're good, you're good, you're good. And I get on, and I'm like, I don't have ID. And the guy's like, where's your ID? And I'm like, oh. and he's like, he's like, where's your ID? He's like really aggressive. I'm like, oh, I'm with them. I'm sorry. And he's like, he's, he's like, you're not military? Like he calls me out for the whole van. It's like 15 passenger van. So you're not military? I'm like, oh, this is not going the way I wanted to. And, he, and I'm like, oh, no, no. And, he, and, he, and he's like, he's like well, what'd your dad do? And I'll never forget, I was, I, was, I was ashamed. I was embarrassed to say what my dad did. And so I was like, yeah, 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 it's pastor. <laughs> and, I was like, and, 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 and the guy kind of, he kind of said something, I just slid in the back. And I'm telling you, that drive down that hill onto the base, like I sat in the back and I was like, I just felt so crunchy. I felt so embarrassed because I, I remember that verse, it, it, the Holy Spirit started to bring to mind that verse that where Jesus said, if you're ashamed in front of me, of me in front of men, the Father will be ashamed of you. And the Holy Spirit started, started to really work with me in like eighth grade, but like, hey, don't ever be ashamed about your faith. Don't ever be ashamed about walking with God. Don't ever be ashamed. I, 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 I was like, man, I wish I could do that again. You ever have something happen in your life? You're like, oh, let's run that back. Give me a mulligan on that one. But it's like, you know what, what conviction turns into, right number two, number two, conviction will turn into courage. So I think what's, what's missing in a lot of us is, is you know things aren't right in your world. But you don't have the courage to change it. You don't have the courage to like make things right in that relationship. You don't have the courage to like have that combo. And a lot of times it's like God starts convicting us about stuff and we're just satisfied that we feel something, but we don't ever do something. The book of James says it this way, the good that a man knows he ought to do and doesn't do, sins. So it's sin to have conviction without courage. The Holy Spirit works in you to embolden you. The Holy Spirit works in you so that you got, you got confidence, you got courage. It's like, like, remember the Wizard of Oz? Remember that was a lion or a bear? What was the guy? He's a coward? Yeah, whatever. And so I don't do petting zoos. And so, and so, so remember Dorothy says to him, Dorothy says to him, you're, 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 you're just a coward. And what does he say back? He starts crying. He's like, yes, you're right. I know it. What is it about you that has more of a coward tendency than a courage tendency? What is it about you that you know something's off in your house, something's off in your world, something's off in your soul, but you haven't yet to step up to, to talk about it, deal with it, do the thing, say the thing, confess it, repent. Listen to me. You're only as sick as your secrets. And the Holy Spirit works in us, not so we can stand on Santa Monica and 3rd Street and say, turn or burn. Why are you doing that? I got the Holy Spirit. I'm bold. No, that's dumb. It's not cool, man. Stop doing that if you're doing that. 
It gives you conviction so you can be courageous. So you can step out in courageous acts. And by the way, the more courage you have, the more courage it gives to others. The more courage you are in your parenting, the more courage, courageous you are in your friendships, the more courage, it builds more courage in others. We don't need people that will bow down or acquiesce or succumb or capitulate. We need people that have backbone. We need people that have, will, will, will stand up with, with confidence. I know where I'm going. I know who I am. I know what I'm not. The world has nothing to offer me. I've already decided to follow Jesus. I don't care. I'm no, the fear of man is a, is a snare. The fear of man is a trap. Why, why, why do we care so much about what other people think? You don't, you're not living until you only care what God thinks. And you're saying, I'm living not for an audience of thousands. If you're living to please your followers on social media, you'll lose every day. But if you live to please the Father in heaven and for an audience of one, you'll win every day. Because now you say, I don't just have conviction. I've got, I've got courage. It's a coward to look at that van driver and be like, huh. It's cowardly. But you know, there's a lot of things in our life that if you look back and go like, man, I was a coward there. I didn't, I didn't step up there. I didn't have a backbone there. I, I, that's disappointing that I dealt with that that way. I, I needed to, this is the Holy Spirit saying, there's more in you. It's the Holy Spirit talking to you saying, I've called you to another standard. By the way, just because you missed the standard the first time doesn't mean you got to stay there. You know what the Bible teaches us? Though a righteous man falls seven times, he still rises. The enemy of your life wants to convince you this is who you really are. But the Holy Spirit in your life wants to convince you this is who you really are. One is an accuser. One is an advocate. One is one that condemns. One that comes to convict. One comes to shame and the other comes to save. The, the question is not, is, is, are you hearing? The question is not, who are you following? Because you got to get convictions and you got to get courage. I got courage. It took, takes courage for Joshua to be like, listen, y'all can serve whoever you want. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It takes courage to be like, you know what? I, I know everybody's going this way. Me and my family, we're going this way. I know all my friends or so they're trying to do this, that, and the other, but I'm swimming upstream. you got to live an upstream life. I'm just telling you, we, we, we got to understand this stuff. So I think some of us are like, oh, I'm spiritual. I'm saved. Yeah, yeah, but you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. So you're in the flesh, which makes you miserable. The freedom you crave is walking with Jesus. The satisfaction you want on your pillow is from obedience in God. You're never going to be happy living for you. You're only going to be happy living for God. Have we concluded yet that we need the Holy Spirit in our life at work? Not so I get chicken skin. So I get courage. So I gotta talk to you. I gotta confess. I gotta confront. I gotta deal. I gotta say, I gotta change something. This is not working. Write down the third thing. Worship team, come join me. Here's the third thing the Holy Spirit gives. He gives urgency. He gives urgency, doesn't he? He's like, you know what? I'm not just gonna convict you or give you the courage. I'm gonna give you like it's today. It's now. It's it's this moment. It's this season. It's like we're gonna, we're gonna do something today. Today's the day. By the way, if you're wondering what's a perfect day to get your life right, today. What's a perfect day to give my life to God? Ah, let's go with October 30th, 2022. Today is the day. The Bible says only a fool waits for perfect conditions. Are you waiting for 78 and sunny? Today's 81. Might as well do it today. We're just missing it a few degrees. What are you waiting for? A, a better outfit, a better moment, a better time? No, today's the day. See, see, your flesh says do it tomorrow. Tomorrow you can do it. Tomorrow we'll sow. Tomorrow we'll, we'll take care. Tomorrow, but the Holy Spirit's like now, today, this moment, this hour, this minute, this hour, this second. Come on, let's get right. Let's repent. Let's forgive. Let's heal. Let's, come on, let's do it today. Jesus 
is the God that stands in front of you and says, don't worry about tomorrow. Seek ye first the kingdom of God today. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of repentance. There needs to be urgency. You're not promised tomorrow. James says, you know, your life's like a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. It's this fast. It's like the twinkling of an eye. You don't know what tomorrow brings. You don't know what tomorrow will hold. You don't know what tomorrow has. I don't know about tomorrow, but today I want urgency. I want urgency. I don't want to leave any regret. I don't want to stand in front of Jesus and be like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have listened more. I wish I would have walked in step. I wish I would have done it better. I wish I, I, why was I waiting? What are you waiting on? Can I just ask you today, what are you waiting on? A better invitation? Here's your invitation. God wants you. He wants all of you. He wants your life. He wants your past, your present, and your future. He wants, he's got something for you. He's not waiting. He's here. He's here right now. He's talking to you. I love you. I'm for you. I called you. Before you were born, I appointed you a prophet. Before you were born, I knit you together in your mother's womb. You've been fearfully and wonderfully created. Oh, you want to clap today and thank him. God has a plan for your life. See, I think, I think, I think, I think the problem, I think the problem for many of us is we've been so insulated with convenience. We've been so, we've been so layered with comfort. We, even your pain is your comfort. <laughs> even, even, the, even the trauma and the drama you got is more, more convenient to you. And he just lulls you to sleep, doesn't he? But the Holy Spirit says, wake up, sleeper. The Holy Spirit says, I got more. I, no, 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 no. You're not going to sleep. Come on, rise, rise, rise. For the light of glory has shined upon you. Rise, come on, stand up. It's time to walk. It's time to run. It's time to go. It's time to preach. It's time to share. It's time to love. It's time to give. It's time to be who God's called you to be. There needs to be some urgency in your life come on don't worry about tomorrow today's the day today's the day to worship today's the day to love today's the day to give God glory today's the day oh come on why don't we just worship our God just for a moment with some urgency that says I've got to lift up some praise to the God worthy of my name come on let's praise him